Everyone believed he was a weak orphan in a new world with Irank skills, but he exacts revenge by destroying them all. Tuka was a troubled kid, abused in his own home by his mother's new boyfriend after his father's death. Every day, the poor boy was beaten up, barely receiving anything to eat, as he cowered in a corner, shielding himself, while his cruel mother watched TV, ignoring his cries of pain. As a result, he grew up a lonely, weak kid with no confidence. He wakes up from a nightmare where his stepfather was beating him, only to hear the class bully, Sho, picking on a nice girl named Ya. Sho snatches her book and waves it around in the air, mocking her for reading girly novels because this ignorant idiot doesn't understand that girls can read whatever they want. Tuka imagines how, in a TV show, he'd be the hero who stops the bullying and earns everyone's admiration. But he knows that, in reality, no one on the bus cares. If he stands up for her, his frail body will just get him beaten up. The most popular students support Sho, while the others laugh along to avoid becoming the next target. The teacher, useless and asleep, does nothing as Sho relentlessly demands Ya's phone number. Without realizing it, Tuka stands up, looks Sho in the eyes, and tells him to leave her alone. Sho laughs, calling him weak, until Kiri, the most popular guy in class, steps in and tells Sho to return the book. Sho obeys, handing the book back to Ya, then moves on to torment another nerd, Yasu. Tuka wonders why he stood up for her, something completely out of character for him, but before he can think further, everyone on the bus is transported to another world. They're all utterly confused, finding themselves in a strange place while a beautiful goddess stands atop a bridge and introduces herself as Viseus. She explains that whenever the threat of a demon king arises, the kingdom of Alien summons brave warriors from other worlds to defend the realm. 200 years ago, the demon king nearly destroyed the kingdom, but thanks to powerful heroes, he was defeated and the entire demon army wiped out. Unfortunately, the Demon King has been resurrected, which is why they've all been brought to this world to fight as the new heroes who will stop him. The students are completely bewildered, wondering if they're dead or if it's some kind of joke. Their teacher tells them to be quiet and listen to what the goddess has to say. Tuka looks around at the ancient architecture, the soldiers clad in armor holding spears, and the goddess with her golden eyes. He pinches himself to check if it's a dream. Kiri speaks up and asks the goddess what happens if they don't cooperate, to which Viseus smiles and replies that she won't be able to send them back to their world. Kiri then asks if there's really a way to return, and Viseus explains that a reverse summoning ritual exists, which can send them home, but to perform it, they must kill the demon king and obtain the evil element, which only drops when he dies. Sho yells at the goddess for dragging them into a new world without a choice and refuses to help. But Viseus kneels down and begs them to save her kingdom from destruction. A student speaks up, saying they're just ordinary humans who can't do anything, but Viseus assures them they possess abilities they never knew about. Sho still believes it's all a joke, so Viseus decides to prove it. She summons a prisoner of war and a giant demon dog. The dog immediately lunges at the prisoner, killing him. Several girls, horrified, fall to their knees as Viseus chants a spell and incinerates the monster in a blaze of fire, erasing it from existence. She then calls the students forward, telling them they'll now measure their latent abilities one by one. Each student steps up to a crystal ball, checking their abilities as the ball glows in different colors. After the nerds go through, Sho approaches the crystal. As soon as his hand touches it, the ball glows bright red. Viseus looks pleased and announces that Sho has a rank skills. Then Kiri steps up, and when he touches the ball, it shines gold before exploding. Afterward, he also checks her abilities and she, too, is revealed to be a rank. After a few more students, another girl steps up and is also a rank. The guards are shocked as Viseus explains that even having one a rank person is extremely rare, but having three is unheard of. Finally, Tuka steps up to the crystal. When he touches it, the ball glows a dull purple. The goddess barely acknowledges him, quickly calling the next person. Tuka tries to ask what rank he is, but she ignores him completely. Realizing that even in this world, he's destined to remain a background character, he walks away. Then Yasu, the nerd, steps up and discovers he possesses a special dark ability that once belonged to a powerful dark hero, who became the strongest of his time. After everyone checks their stats, Viseus tells them they also have personal abilities that vary from person to person. Then, she announces it's time for an important ritual. She calls Tuka to the front, and a guard roughly pushes him into a dark pit. Viseus declares that Tuka is Irank, the lowest in the entire class. Historically, Irank individuals cause problems and are usually eliminated. But since they have so many strong heroes this time, she'll give him a chance to survive. Tuka will be sent to an abandoned ruin, a dungeon far away where criminals and monsters are sent. If he manages to survive, he will earn the right to live. Otherwise, he'll lose his life. Tuka tries to argue that he can improve, 
but Vistius tells him he's a failure, meaning his stats are so low that even with intense training, he won't get better. Angrily, Tuka says he never asked to be brought there, that he was summoned against his will only to be thrown away. But Kiri cuts him off, saying he's wasting everyone's time, and the girls are already tired. The whole class agrees. Defeated, Tuka collapses to the ground. Yasu approaches, and Tuka remembers how he once helped Yasu after being bullied, but Yasu rejects him, saying an e-ranker should show more respect to his superiors. Tuka loses all hope as the goddess begins the ceremony. During the ritual, they throw a leather bag at Tuka as his special item, but it turns out to be completely useless. It tries to defend him, saying that this isn't fair. Frustrated beyond measure, Tuka raises his arm and casts a paralysis spell at the goddess, but she easily blocks it and mocks him, calling him a loser for even attempting to hit her with his low-level E-ranked skills. Kiri also steps in, casting a massive fireball spell, saying he was just testing it by using a small amount of mana. Everyone laughs at the huge difference in power between themselves and someone like Tuka. Tuka, feeling defeated, lowers his head as tears roll down his face, recalling how he used to cry as a child. Suddenly, a voice from within his soul urges him to stop pretending to be kind and show his true nature, the side of him he's been suppressing for so long. Finally, Tuka snaps, looking up with hatred in his eyes. He curses the goddess, calling her a rotten hoe, and warns her to be prepared if he ever returns alive. Instantly, he is teleported into a dark cave. Trying to access his status screen, he fails because of the dim lighting. He channels some mana into the leather bag, which causes the gem inside to light up, acting as a lantern as he navigates the cave. It's then that Tuka realizes he's walking on skeletons, which sends a shiver down his spine. He wonders what could have wiped out all these people when a monster suddenly attacks. He narrowly avoids the blow and starts running as fast as he can, the creature hot on his trail. As he runs, Tuka debates whether he should turn and fight, but deep down, he knows that the level gap is so vast that stopping would mean certain death. Overcome with fear, he trips over a rock and falls to the ground. When he looks up, the monster is closing in. Frustration over his life choices fuels him, and just as the beast is about to strike, Tuka makes a last-ditch attempt to save himself, casting his paralysis spell. To his astonishment, the monster is frozen in place. He quickly scrambles to his feet and continues running. Before long, Tuka reaches the end of the cave, where another bird-like demon approaches him with deadly intent. Tuka instinctively raises his arm again, casting the paralysis spell, which once more immobilizes the enemy. Realizing that it wasn't a fluke, he starts to feel the exhaustion set in. He checks his status screen and sees that his mana is almost entirely drained. Desperate, he tries his poison spell, which proves effective as the demon's body turns black and begins to bleed. Tuka slumps down on the cave floor, wondering why his spells are suddenly so effective against these creatures. Out of nowhere, Tuka hears a noise behind him. He turns to see that the Minotaur demon has broken free of his paralysis spell and is about to deliver the final blow. Instead of fleeing, all the anger and resentment toward those who mistreated him floods back. Even though he's completely spent, Tuka lifts his arms toward the demon, determined to fight for his life. He challenges the creature, not knowing if he'll survive this time. His body instinctively enters survival mode, and he tries to figure out any possible escape route. Surrounded by monsters waiting to tear him apart, he wonders if he can still use his skills despite having no mana. Recalling that in the games he played, using skills without mana could be fatal, he decides to take the risk, knowing that if he does nothing, he'll surely die. He targets one of the monsters and uses his paralysis spell, but this time it fails. The creature launches a relentless attack, forcing Tuka to dodge and retreat. Realizing that casting the same spell twice on the same monster won't work, he notices that he has unlocked a new spell, sleep. Just as the monster is about to crush him, Tuka casts the sleep spell, and to his relief, the creature collapses motionless. He quickly follows up with the poison spell, ensuring the monster won't come back to life. But using his skills without mana is taking a serious toll on his body. Before Tuka can catch his breath, a massive horde of monsters charges toward him. Thinking quickly, he uses his enchanted bag like a flashbang, blinding the creatures, and immediately begins casting paralysis spells to stop them in their tracks. As he stands there, he contemplates using his poison spell on all of them, but he's too weak. Suddenly, more monsters emerge from the depths of the dungeon, overwhelming his senses. Despite the odds, Tuka decides he won't go down without a fight and starts casting paralysis on any monster that gets close. His body starts to feel heavy, and he becomes dizzy, but he forces himself to keep fighting. Just as he's about to lose hope, Tuka levels up, and with it, his mana and status are fully restored. This gives him the power to fire off even more paralysis spells, saving himself for now. 
Realizing he leveled up because the bird demon died from his poison, Tuka gets an idea. He begins paralyzing all the monsters, determined to gain as many levels as possible while battling for his life. He unlocks a new ability that lets him paralyze entire groups of enemies at once. As he does, he wonders why his spell didn't work on the goddess, especially since it's been 100% effective in the dungeon. Casually, he walks past the immobilized enemies, casting his poison spell on them as he goes. When the monsters start dying, he levels up again and sits on a rock, grinning as he realizes he's created a real-life XP farm, much like in Minecraft where he can gain levels quickly. Checking his status, he's shocked to see that he's already reached level 250, with an enormous pool of mana. Another monster falls, and once again, Tuka gains several levels at once. He then uses his sleep spell on the remaining monsters, hoping to level it up as well. When one of the creatures dies, he earns more levels, eventually reaching level 500 within just a few minutes. Confident that he can now escape alive with this many levels, he stays cautious, as there are still many monsters around. He stands up and observes the remaining creatures, but suddenly, they turn and flee from him. He scavenges whatever equipment he can find from the corpses of fallen adventurers, managing to acquire a cloak and a few other small items. As he ventures deeper into the cave, encountering even more monsters, Tuka realizes he hasn't eaten in a long time and is extremely hungry. Unsure where to find food, he remembers the monsters he's already killed. Returning to the site of the massacre, he finds a creature on which the poison spell has worn off. He draws his sword and tries to carve some meat, only to find that the skin is too tough. Frustrated, Tuka wonders if he'll die of starvation, even after defeating all the monsters. Then, he notices the gem on his bag glowing purple. Curious, he opens the bag and is surprised to find some jerky and a bottle of cola inside. Overcome with emotion, he hungrily gulps down the drink, nearly choking, and devours the jerky in peace. He marvels at how the bag works and wonders if it will provide more food in the future. Two days pass, and Tuka grows so powerful that he can now defeat large hordes of deadly monsters with ease, sitting calmly on a rock and casting spells thanks to his near-infinite mana supply. Surveying the scene of carnage, he reflects on his life and what went wrong for him to end up in this situation. He recalls his childhood dreams of killing his mother's abusive boyfriend, knowing that if he hadn't, the man would have eventually killed him. Fortunately, his life changed when his aunt and uncle rescued him from that miserable existence and raised him. He had decided then to be a good person, always kind to others. Snapping back to the present, Tuka looks around at the destruction he's caused. Though he feels no sorrow for the dead, he realizes that he was always a monster deep down and decides to embrace it. After leveling up again to level 950, Tuka continues deeper into the dungeon, where he encounters a floating eye monster, which he quickly kills with his paralyzed poison combo. Moving ahead, he discovers a room where two adventurers have died. Searching their belongings, he finds a bag full of gems, which he takes before continuing. Eventually, he enters a large room where he finds a skeleton. Upon inspecting the body, he discovers a wound that caused the person's death and a parchment with a message. The note reveals that the skeleton belongs to the dark hero Vice had mentioned. The dark hero writes that he was sent here by the evil goddess Vis after she had no further use for him, warning anyone who finds the letter never to trust her. Angrily, Tuka crumples the parchment, realizing that the Demon King isn't the only evil being in this world. The goddess herself is just as wicked. Inside the dark hero's bag, Tuka finds a giant magical book filled with dark magic techniques for creating items and spells. He also finds a scroll but is unable to read it, so he puts it in his bag. After taking the hero's clothes, Tuka notices a bloodstain on one of the pages, which states that the Soul Eater killed everyone. Grateful to the dead hero, Tuka leaves and walks through the corridors until he finds a massive door. He realizes he needs to unlock something to open it, so he checks his status and sees that he is now at level 1200. Tuka wonders if he's strong enough to kill the Soul Eater, who waits in the next hallway. As he tries to enter, a beam strikes him, grazing his hand and forcing him to bandage it. He wonders how he can defeat an entity that even the Dark Hero couldn't defeat, concluding that the Soul Eater is the final boss and the key to escaping this place. Suddenly, the Soul Eater begins moving toward him, vomiting a disgusting substance that transforms into half-dead humans. Tuka paralyzes them but can't bring himself to use poison since they still look somewhat human. Meanwhile, the Soul Eater breaks through the wall, screaming. Tuka, overwhelmed and in mental agony, tries to retreat, but more half-dead humans push him into a corner. He cries out for help, amusing the Soul Eater, who laughs at his suffering. But this is exactly what Tuka had been waiting for. 
The moment the monster drops its guard, Tuka casts his paralysis spell, and the Soul Eater falls to the ground, stunned. Tuka laughs, boasting that he tricked the demon with his acting, knowing it was the only way to make the creature lower its defenses. He tells the Soul Eater that all his life, he pretended to be a kind, harmless person, but now his true self has emerged. In this kill-or-be-killed world, Tuka no longer cares how many half-dead humans the monster spews out, it doesn't matter to him. Whether it's a monster, a half-dead human, or a living person, Tuka is ready to kill them all without remorse. The Soul Eater begins bleeding from its eyes as Tuka calmly walks over and uses his sleep spell on everyone around him, finishing them off for good. After a while, the Soul Eater dies, and a stream of souls escapes its body, transforming into ethereal human forms. They thank Tuka for defeating the monster, explaining that they had been trapped inside it with no way of escaping while it killed countless others. Finally, the dark hero appears and urges Tuka to deal with the evil goddess before vanishing. Tuka retrieves the gem from the Soul Eater's body and approaches the main gate. Placing the gem in the door, it opens. He wonders what he'll do once he gets his hands on the goddess. He wonders what he'll do once he gets his hands on the goddess. Meanwhile, far away in the forests outside the royal capital, the rest of Tuka's classmates are busy hunting demons to gain levels, while Sho chases a demon dog with a sword. Kiri uses his powerful skill to incinerate another monster, reaching level 18 successfully. Meanwhile, Yasu, who has undergone a complete personality change, uses his dark flames to burn some monsters and laughs at their cries. Far away, a shy and innocent girl named Koba struggles with the idea of killing any monsters, but a bully named Aggie insists she must do so or face death, as this is the first test given by the goddess. Aggie keeps Koba tightly controlled and warns her that soon the class will fragment into various factions because of the many selfish people among them. Being a B-rank, Aggie intends to form her own faction with the girls who follow her. She knows that Koba, being only a D-rank, won't be accepted by Kiri's faction or other powerful ones, and even Yasu won't be able to take her in, as she will die soon. Koba is terrified by this, but Aggie dismisses her concerns about minor details. Aggie just wants Koba to be her personal plaything and has instructed the girls in her faction to trap a monster for her to easily finish off. Aggie demands that Koba kill the monster and pass the test given by Vic, or she will be discarded like Tuka. Koba is reluctant to kill the pitiful monster, but Aggie pressures her into it, effectively forcing her to act. Eventually, Koba kills the monster, but the act of violence devastates her, reminding her of a time when Nemo helped an injured stray kitten. Overcome with guilt, she cries, feeling she failed Tuka. Meanwhile, A also comes back to her senses, her gut pain reminding her of how the goddess knocked her out before sending Tuka away. She immediately confronts goddess Vic, who puts on a poor performance, claiming she was also deeply hurt by sending Tuka into danger, but it is the kingdom's policy. Vic adds that the ritual to remove the weakest member of the group will continue, and while Yasu was asleep, she has already sent away those who couldn't kill a single demon. Yasu is furious with the goddess and tells her that her methods are wrong. Vic dismisses this, saying everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but she won't change her ways to accommodate them. Yasu then suggests that as an S-rank hero, she will work hard to cover for those who can't perform well enough, and in return, she wants Vic to stop banishing them. Vic agrees to this arrangement and asks Yasu to shake hands to put the past behind them and start afresh. Elsewhere, in the dark forests bordering the abandoned ruins, a woman is fleeing from a group of nasty bandits. However, she is careless and leaves easy clues for them. The bandits plan to let her run until she is exhausted because they will eventually corner and capture her. At the same time, Tuka emerges from the ruins, checking his stats and finding his mana over 59,000. However, he is more interested in learning about his skills. He discovers he can use the paralysis skill on specific body parts of his target, in addition to their entire body. He can also weaken his poison skill to make it non-lethal. He plans to test these abilities once he encounters some demons. As he continues walking, he hears squeaking sounds from behind the trees and discovers a group of slimes bullying a smaller slime. Tuka feels sympathy for the small slime, which shows more courage than usual and fights back against its bullies. Tuka decides it's the perfect moment to test his new skills. He paralyzes all the slimes and applies non-lethal poison to the bullies. He then dispels the poison and paralysis effects from the bullies, making them flee. He turns to the small slime, praising it for standing up to the bullies. Tuka informs the slime that he will release it from paralysis and asks it not to attack him. He releases the skill and continues on his way, but the slime follows him. 
Toka decides to adopt the slime, thinking it is another outcast like himself. He places the slime in his hood to keep watch behind him and alert him to danger. Meanwhile, Tuka reads a book on forbidden arts by the dark hero and finds a recipe for a medicine that can strengthen even slimes. He tells the small slime that he is on a quest for vengeance against those who wronged him and asks if it still wants to follow him. The slime agrees and Tuka names it Pig Maru, which the slime likes. Tuka continues his journey, but suddenly he is surrounded by the bandits pursuing the mysterious woman. The bandits were trying to tire her out but detected another presence and decided to have some fun. The bandit leader demands Tuka hand over all his valuables or face death. Tuka is terrified, as the bandits look menacing, and he has never fought humans before. The bandits argue about catching the girl quickly versus wasting time with random strangers, giving Tuka a chance to sneak away. However, the leader orders him to stop. Tuka begs for his life, but this only makes the bandit more determined to kill him. The leader charges at Tuka, but it turns out Tuka was just pretending to be scared. He uses his paralysis skill to stop the leader's movement and takes his time to berate the bandits, calling them scum. He says that, despite being weaker than the demons of the ruins, their evil intentions are even more intense. Even Pig Maru is enraged by the bandits. Tuka says that killing such people won't weigh on his conscience and that he is happy to have eased the burden on earth. He casts a poison spell on all the bandits, and once they die, Tuka senses another presence nearby. The presence belongs to the mysterious girl, who has used her tribe's special technique to summon spiritual armor for protection. She can also sense Tuka's presence and detect someone very powerful nearby, though the aura is uncertain. She doesn't want to take chances and swings her sword, cutting through a bush where Pig Maru was hiding. Tuka then arrives behind her and paralyzes her. She stammers, asking what he wants, and he says he only wants information because he is new to the area. The girl asks about the four bandits, and Tuka inquires if they are her allies. She denies it, and Tuka believes her, as she lacks the evil intent the bandits had. He removes the paralysis skill from her head, so she can talk freely and warns her not to try anything or he will kill her. Tuka tells her that he doesn't trust anyone, especially strangers he is meeting for the first time. Before he can question her, the girl asks what happened to the four bandits. Tuka tells her he killed all of them, and she is shocked. Because the group of thugs was known for their impressive strength, she asks Tuka if he fought all four of them by himself or if he had assistance. Tuka, however, refuses to provide any details. The girl, believing that Tuka is not a bad person, decides to trust him and says she will answer any questions he asks truthfully. Tuka starts to trust her a bit more due to her cooperative attitude, but this is still not enough to release her. As they talk, Tuka learns that he is not in the alien kingdom, but in the forest of the Urza kingdom to the south. He gains a lot of information and then finally asks the girl if she can read the forbidden spell scroll. She can only tell him that it is written in a unique type of ancient script that almost no one can read, but she knows someone who can. She mentions a person called the Forbidden Witch, who was exiled from her homeland due to her excessive knowledge being deemed too dangerous. The girl advises Tuka to visit the Golden Demon Zone if he wants to meet the witch, as it is a perilous area in the heart of the continent. Tuka thanks the girl for the valuable information, and she thanks him in return for rescuing her from the bandits. Tuka says the information balances things out, and the girl wishes him good luck. He finds her honesty and innocence endearing, reminding him of his aunt. After telling the girl that the paralysis spell will wear off in a few minutes, allowing her to go on her way, he decides to leave. Piggy, his pet slime, hops onto his shoulder. They discuss how it's unlikely the girl will attack them once she's free from the paralysis spell, but Tuka still wants his slime partner to keep an eye out just in case. Tuka soon arrives in a small town named Mills, where a female knight on duty is rather curious about his business. She suspects he's a country bumpkin who has come to work as a mercenary and raid some ruins. However, she grants him permission to enter because the town lord has ordered that all mercenaries be allowed in, especially those planning to raid the ruins. Tuka thanks her and heads inside, noting the lack security, as they didn't even check his luggage or ask for identification, which works to his advantage. He soon reaches an inn where a grumpy old man greets him. Initially unfriendly, the man becomes more accommodating when Tuka shows him a silver coin. He asks for Tuka's name, and Tuka uses the alias Hattie to stay at the inn. At night, Tuka explores the town and finds it quite peaceful despite the presence of many outsiders and mercenaries. The town has all the typical shops of a settlement of this size in a high fantasy anime, and also features an adventurer's guild. After gathering all the information he can, he returns to the inn and eats some food, pretending it's delicious even though it's not to his taste. He listens intently to the drunk men at the neighboring table to gather information about the world. The drunk men are discussing the strongest knight orders on the continent. One mentions the holy knights under the mad emperor falcon, who have never lost a war. 
Others name other popular knight orders and believe that the magic knights of the Urza Kingdom are on par with them. However, they all agree that the most powerful knight order on the continent is the Black Dragon Knights, who destroyed the Holy Kingdom of Nia in record time. They rave about the strength of the Black Dragon Knights, who also have the world's strongest hero killer among them. Having heard enough, Tuka decides to leave and take some food to his pet slime Piggy. As Piggy eats rice, Tuka starts planning for the future. He decides he should first find someone who can read the forbidden magic spell. He recalls that the girl in the forest mentioned meeting the forbidden witch in the Golden Demon Zone. Before that, he plans to use a strengthening agent to boost Piggy's strength. He suddenly remembers the drunk men talking about a newly discovered layer of ruins in their territory, attracting mercenaries from everywhere and boosting the town's prosperity. Tuka thinks he might find the skeleton king's bones in the ruins, crucial for making the strengthening agent. The next morning, he joins the mercenaries heading to the ruins. They are greeted by Marquis Creed, the lord of the region, who announces a newly found lair in the mill's ruins and offers a reward of 300 gold coins for anyone who discovers the ultimate treasure, the cup of the dragon's eye. He promises to buy all the dungeon loot at a high price and tells the mercenaries they can keep the monster drops. The registration process begins, and Tuka notices a pompous noble named Flash hitting on a hooded girl. Flash remarks that her voice resembles that of a leader of the Holy Knight army from the ruined kingdom of Nia. This sparks gossip among the mercenaries, who wonder if the Knight Princess of Nia is truly here, given her substantial bounty. Flash continues to flirt aggressively, even mentioning her physical features, comparing them to the elf princess who once rejected his dinner invitation. The woman tells him he's mistaken, so he demands she remove her hood to prove she's not an elf. Confident that her pointy ears will reveal her true identity, he plans to claim the bounty. However, when he removes the hood, the girl has normal human ears, leaving Flash shocked. Tuka recognizes the girl from the forest but chooses not to intervene as she handles the situation herself, sending Flash away in embarrassment. Afterward, Tuka heads to a shop to buy some equipment but encounters the hooded girl again. She recognizes him and approaches, discussing the raid. Tuka warns her to be cautious with people like Flash, who might seek revenge out of spite. She replies that she doesn't mind and explains she acts rudely to keep people away. Tuka then asks for her help in purchasing tools for exploring the ruins, fearing he might be overcharged. He offers to pay her for her assistance, and the girl accepts gladly as she needs the money. She introduces herself as Mist, a name Tuka realizes is fake. He also introduces himself as Hattie, explaining that he too is using a fake name due to personal circumstances. Mist helps Tuka buy good equipment, and he gives her three silver coins for her advice, which is more than she expected. She thanks him and starts to leave but suddenly collapses from exhaustion. Tuka notices the dark circles under her eyes as he supports her, but Mist insists she just needs rest and runs away. The next day, Tuka enters the mill's ruins and immediately finds some mercenaries fleeing from a demon calf, a younger version of the minotaur he fought in the previous ruins. He paralyzes and poisons the demon before finishing it off with his short sword. Meanwhile, the mercenaries call for their senior to defeat the demon calf and are astonished to see it defeated by someone with just a single stab of a short sword. Unfazed by the situation, Tuka continues into the ruins and finds that the demons there pose no real threat to him. As he explores, he overhears Flash asking two rough mercenaries for help to kill Mist. Flash, unable to tolerate anyone who humiliates him, plans to torture her before killing her, and then feed her remains to the demons. Disturbed by the depravity of such individuals, Tuka decides to intervene. Flash and his henchmen prepare to attack, but Tuka attempts to buy time by apologizing and promising to keep their conversation secret. Flash, however, is determined to kill him. As Flash attacks, Tuka paralyzes him and his men, poisons them, and finds it oddly satisfying to eliminate such filth from the world. He walks away, while Flash curses him, vowing revenge. Tuka left them alive only because powerful demons were approaching. The demons soon consume the paralyzed mercenaries, and Tuka proceeds deeper into the ruins with a clear conscience. He decides to take a brief nap before exploring further, with Piggy on guard. Tuka delves deeper into the ruins, leaving behind a trail of dead monsters. This leads him to being confronted by a skilled adventurer group called the Sabertooth Tigers. Their leader, Lily, and vice leader, Foes, suspect that a very powerful enemy is behind the deaths of the monsters and decide to retreat for their safety. They only stop Tuka to offer him the option of joining them. He thanks them but chooses to continue. He believes that killing more demons and scattering them will drive more mercenaries out, improving his chances of obtaining what he seeks. Eventually, he arrives at the room where the dragon's eye cup is kept. Noticing a dragon statue behind it and having enough anime knowledge to anticipate an attack, 
Tuka paralyzes and poisons the statue first, and then takes the cup. As the statue dies, Mist appears, surprised that someone reached the room before her. She laments that sleeping cost her the grand prize, but Tuka has no problem giving her the cup. Mist is astonished and asks what she should pay, but Tuka insists she can keep it, explaining that his current persona is extremely naive, especially around attractive girls. Mist feels it would harm her honor to accept something worth 300 gold coins for free, but Tuka persists, saying he doesn't need the cup or the money. He then starts fiddling with the platform, revealing a hidden passage leading deeper into the dungeon. He tells Mist that what he's after is further inside the next floor, and that he used the recruitment offer to reach this point. Mist then offers to be his bodyguard to repay him for the cup, insisting she will be helpful. After some thought, Tuka agrees, setting two conditions. She must not pry into his personal affairs, and he can't guarantee they'll exit the ruins soon. Mist agrees immediately, swearing to protect him with her life. Soon after, they encounter a creepy plant monster with golden eyes, which Mist quickly defeats with her sword skills. Tuka applauds her and asks about the golden-eyed demons. Mist explains that these demons have high experience points and help heroes from other worlds level up quickly. She adds that otherworldly heroes can't gain experience from killing humans, so they need to keep killing demons. Mist also mentions that a special magical element from the Demon King turns normal creatures and demons into golden-eyed versions, making them more powerful and fierce. This makes Tuka think of Kiri, the golden hero, and he gets a creepy feeling that his power might be related to this phenomenon. They soon reach a resting area, where Mist senses a nearby monster. Tuka realizes it must be Piggy, so he brings the slime out and introduces it to Mist. They quickly become friends, and Tuka suggests Mist take a nap, as she badly needs rest. She reluctantly agrees and lies down, but Piggy starts dancing in front of her. Mist gets distracted, and Tuka takes advantage of this to put her to sleep with his skills. To his surprise, Mist then glows and reverts to her elven form. Tuka always suspected but now confirms that Mist is actually Siras, the princess knight of the Holy Kingdom of Nia. Meanwhile, in the forest where Tuka defeated the bandits pursuing Mist, the leader of the Black Dragon Knights is observing the carnage. He believes Mist defeated the powerful bandits herself and looks forward to fighting her next. The following day, as Mist wakes up, her transformation skill activates, making her look like a normal human. She panics, fearing Tuka might have seen her true form, but feels relieved when she finds him asleep on the floor. Piggy approaches and starts squeaking, which Tuka interprets as a signal to stop pretending. They resume their dungeon exploration. When they sense the floor rumbling and shaking, they decide to flee. Suddenly, a giant monster bursts through the wall, and Mist recognizes it as the Skeleton King. Tuka identifies it as the dungeon's boss monster, much stronger than any demon they've encountered. Mist knows that the peculiar bone under its chin is its weak spot, and breaking it will ensure their victory. She believes normal mercenaries stand no chance against the Skeleton King, but together they might succeed. The Skeleton King seems to view Mist as a greater threat than Tuka, which Tuka accepts. Mist activates her power, telling Tuka she needs to use it to defeat the boss, but must keep it a secret. She asks him to keep her secret as special armor appears on her. The Skeleton King begins charging an energy blast, and Mist tells Tuka to run if she cannot defeat it. Tuka acts first by paralyzing the boss with his skill. Mist is confused but realizes Tuka is the man she met in the forest as he casts a poison spell on the Skeleton King. The Skeleton King dies from the poison, and Tuka collects the bones needed for the strengthening potion. Tuka observes Mist and realizes her mind is full of questions, so he promises to answer them once they are back on the surface. They start their journey back when Piggy alerts Tuka to something inside the Skeleton King's body. Tuka begins to investigate and discovers a small bundle within the demon's chest cavity. As soon as he picks up the bundle, it starts glowing and a strange symbol appears on it. Opening the bundle, Tuka finds an unusual egg, but Piggy seems very eager to have it, so Tuka decides to carry it with him. Meanwhile, Tuka's classmates have also ventured into their first dungeon. Some students flee as skeletal knights start pursuing them, while a girl sits on the ground crying over her severed arm. Her friend attempts to help her, but they are attacked by monsters. Everyone manages to escape somehow, and Yis stands her ground against the monsters, determined to stop them. However, before she can act, Sho and Kiri arrive and defeat the monsters in one go. Kiri uses his attack without concern for his classmates, forcing Ya to protect them. Kiri, proud of his newfound strength, reveals that he is now level 24. Back in the dungeon city, Tuka and Mist reach the surface, where Mist presents the dragon's eye cup to the guards, attracting everyone's attention to the ultimate treasure of the dungeon. Tuka silently takes his leave, and Mist follows him, informing him that she will receive her reward from the Lord the next day in a public ceremony. Tuka asks if she is free until then, and upon receiving an affirmative answer, 
He invites Miss to his room that night to discuss some matters. She agrees and takes his hand as he is leaving to thank him again for the cup. At night, Tuka is preparing a strengthening agent when Mist arrives at his door. Tuka tells her he wants to hire her as his escort for the remainder of his journey. He mentions that with the reward money from the cup, she is well set, but he still wants to hire her. He's trying to make her feel indebted by mentioning the cup, even though he doesn't like this approach. Tuka then shows her a map and explains that he wants to reach the Golden Demon Zone at the center of the continent to meet the Forbidden Witch. He claims that, given the many powerful monsters there, he needs someone skilled by his side, and Mist is the only one he can trust. Mist seems hesitant about going to such a dangerous area, and Tuka tells her she can take her time to decide. He then unexpectedly calls her by her real name, Ceres, and she responds out of habit, only realizing afterward that she has been tricked. Tuka apologizes but reveals he used his skill to put her to sleep in the dungeon, so he knows her secret. He says he needs her as a valuable asset and won't betray her. He knew that what troubled her most about traveling with him was her secret, but now it's out in the open. Miss stops hiding her secrets and explains that she can conceal her true form with the help of spirits, but they need her to sleep to regain their strength. She reveals her true form to Tuka, saying she trusts him now. In return, Tuka discloses his real name so they are even. She agrees to join him as his escort, and Tuka gives her one of the blue crystals he found in the first dungeon as payment. Mist is stunned to see it because the crystal is a rare item called Blue Dragonstone, which is no longer available on the market. Just this single piece is worth more than the reward she received for turning in the cup. She refuses to accept something so valuable and returns it to Tuka, who thinks she is too good-hearted for her own good. He takes the stone from her and then tosses it back, saying it belongs to her now, and she can discard it if she doesn't want it. She reluctantly accepts it and then tries to tell Tuka about her past and the people still pursuing her. However, he says he is not interested in her past because, as her employer, he only cares about her abilities. The next day, while having breakfast together, people in the inn start making negative comments about them. Tuka tells Miss to ignore them and then asks what she knows about forbidden spells. She tells him that goddess Vicious banned some ancient spells and classified them as forbidden. Tuka thinks that if the goddess banned them, the spells might be dangerous for her. He thanks Mist for the information, and she blushes because it is the first time he has thanked her openly. Afterward, Mist leaves to collect her reward while Tuka goes to the forest to use the strengthening medicine on Piggy. Mist finds herself out of place at a party full of nobles and wealthy men. It is getting late, and she has not yet received her reward. At that moment, the Lord announces a famous magician who can break illusions as entertainment for his guests. Mist worries she might be exposed, and seeing that she is late, Tuka begins to suspect foul play. Back with his classmates, Ye visits goddess Vicious to inquire about treatment for the girl who lost her arm. V says she healed the girl only because she was a B-rank hero. She then asks Ya if she is not joining Kiri's group and tries to manipulate her into thinking it is selfish not to partner with another S-rank hero despite the situation. He remains firm and says she cannot work with Kiri at the moment. She vows to fulfill her duties as an S-rank hero on her own, and upon hearing this, V says she will let all the students who did not pass the first trial with her so she can train them. Ya panics and reminds the goddess of their deal that those students would be left unbothered if she fought on their behalf. However, the goddess says she received an order from the king and has no choice. She tells Ya that if she doesn't take the unsuccessful students with her, they will be disposed of, and Ya has no choice but to accept Vicious's order. On Tuka's side, he wonders if Mist has betrayed them and fled with the prize money, or if something has happened to her. The first option seems unlikely so he decides to find her. On the way, he hears people talking about the girl who got the cup being the wanted elf princess. They say she ran into the forest after her secret was revealed, but it won't save her because the black dragon knights are on her trail. Just then, three dragons appear in the sky and head toward the forest where Mist is trying to escape. One of the dragon knights attacks her, and Mist first uses her spirit magic to bring it down with an aerial slash. She enchants her sword to defeat the second and third dragon knights, but she is exhausted from fighting them, even though they are low-ranking knights. Then, a spear appears. A dragon is charging towards her, but Mist realizes it's a decoy and the real threat is in front of her. She charges ahead and clashes swords with a high-ranking knight named Jizen, who tells her that she is going to die there. Mist can't use her spirit armor to fight at full strength because of the illusion-breaking spell earlier, and Jizen keeps pushing her back while revealing that he received orders to kill her on sight instead of capturing her alive. However, he plans to have some fun with her before killing her. He continues to push Mist back, and when she loses her balance and falls, he kicks her sword away before pouncing on her. Fortunately, Tuka arrives just in time, paralyzing Jizen and his dragon. Mist gets out of the situation and asks Tuka what he's doing there, 
while Tuka applies a non-lethal poison on Jizen, putting him to sleep before talking with Mist. He reminds her that they can't discuss personal matters with others around. Tuka explains that he returned to pick her up, but she tells him she can't accept his job offer now because he would also be pursued by the Dragon Knights if he stayed with her. She tries to return the Blue Dragon Stone to him, but he gets irritated and throws a pouch full of Dragon Stones back at her. Mist is perplexed by this, and Tuka tells her that he can't find a better escort than her and doesn't want to bother trying. He then abruptly asks her to undress. Mist wonders if she heard that correctly. Tuka looks at her, annoyed that she doesn't understand what he wants, and explains that everyone recognized her because of her outfit, so she needs to change to throw off the trail. He then tells her that he needs her to find the Witch of the Woods, as he needs to know what these forbidden spells are, and she might even help her hide her identity better. He then moves towards Jizen, removes the sleep spell, and asks him who sent him to kill Mist. Jizen looks up at him, wondering when he will die, but Tuka promises that if he reveals the truth, he will be spared, and Tuka would remove the poison spell. Jizen decides to reveal the secret, wanting to see how the elf princess would react. But before he can say anything, Tuka senses danger and pulls Mist away as a huge sword smashes Jizen's head. Tuka turns around to see three dragon riders led by a young man with silver hair and glaring red eyes, who declares himself as the strongest troop of humanity, known as Civet. He descends with his three companions and introduces their unit as the five dragon riders. Jizen used to be a part of their group, but he talked too much, which is why he had to die. One of them seems a bit more flamboyant with his trendy haircut, while another wants to cosplay as a pirate and suggests using Mist as a ball and tossing her around the field before killing her, as the king himself ordered her death on sight. The flamboyant one tells the pirate to be quiet since the king wants Mist's corpse to look as beautiful as she does in real life. Mist is horrified by what these men are saying. She draws her sword, claiming she won't die so easily, but the men don't take her seriously. Civet offers her a chance to win a duel against him, promising that if she wins, he will leave her alone. However, his attention quickly shifts to Tuka, as he is now more interested in the strange foreign man than in the elf princess. Tuka realizes his life is in grave danger, feeling the power of this man is a hundred times greater than what he faced before. Despite this, he smirks and asks Civet if they can have a chat. Civet asks his name, but Tuka gives a fake name, which Civet immediately recognizes and becomes even more intrigued. The pirate, seemingly clueless, asks why Civet is so interested in the boy, but Civet replies that this boy isn't trembling in front of the dragon riders and even wants to converse with the strongest man of humanity. Tuka realizes he needs to play his cards right to survive this and asks Civet if he simply wants to fight the strongest enemies he can find on Earth to satisfy his battle hunger. Civet acknowledges this but claims that few enemies can provide a good fight. Tuka then asks why he doesn't fight Goddess Vis, to which Civet responds that while the goddess is strong, their kingdoms have a peace treaty, but if war ever broke out, he would love to fight the heroes she summoned from another world, as they are supposed to be incredibly strong. Tuka smiles while Civet grows bored with Mist and tells her he doesn't want to fight a weakling like her. He asks her to drop her sword and accept her death. Mist refuses, which annoys the white-haired knight. Tuka decides to sweeten the deal, telling Civet that if he wants to fight a strong opponent who can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, he should choose Tuka, as he is a hero from another world. Everyone is shocked, including Mist, who had no idea. Civet laughs, claiming he knew something was different about Tuka. He asks why the hero is wandering so far from his kingdom, and Tuka reveals the truth, explaining that the goddess considered him a different class from other heroes and sent him away. There's no trace of deceit, but Civet believes Tuka must be a very strong hero, and that's why he was sent alone. He asks what Tuka wants in return, and Tuka replies that he wants to postpone their match for now. Civet laughs and asks what he will get in return. Tuka says he will train to become stronger than anyone, even the goddess herself, and then return to fight Civet in an all-out death match. Civet laughs maniacally and says he would love to see that one day, telling Tuka he is free to go on his way, and that the dragon riders will leave after dealing with the elf princess. Tuka's expression changes, and he tells Civet that he can't let them do anything to Mist because he needs her to help him get stronger. Civet laughs again, saying he's fine with that as he really wants to fight Tuka soon. Karen tries to protest, but Civet tells him to shut up if he wants to stay alive. Soon, they all take flight, and Civet tells Tuka to get stronger before his patience runs out. Tuka smiles and bids him farewell, waiting for them to come within his intended range before using his paralysis spell on them. Civet realizes something is wrong, but it's too late as all the dragons and their riders fall one by one. Tuka laughs, saying this isn't some heroic tale where people honor their words, but his gritty story of revenge against the world, and he doesn't care how he achieves it. Civet struggles on the ground, angrily asking what Tuka did, but Tuka doesn't bother to reply and uses poison on all of them, killing them immediately. Civet continues to struggle even after being hit by the poison spell, reminding Tuka of the Soul Eater, 
the only other monster that managed to move a bit while poisoned. Civet is much stronger, though, as he picks up his lance to throw at Tuka but ends up collapsing from exhaustion. Suddenly, an alarm goes off for backup, and a huge horde of dragon riders arrives. Civet tries to issue orders, telling them to keep their distance and kill both Tuka and Mist, but the dragon riders are too shocked to see the strongest four, including their leader Civet, either dead or dying. Tuka tells Mist she can escape while she still has a chance, but she insists on staying by his side as his bodyguard. Tuka smiles and connects with Piggy, using his newly learned ability. Soon, Piggy emerges and sends a bunch of tentacles towards the flying dragon riders, extending Tuka's range as he uses his paralysis spell on them. Soon, dragons and humans start falling from the sky. Tuka decides to use these men as test subjects and casts various spells on them to experiment. He applies a berserk spell on Karen, causing him to become enraged and start calling the manager, while he casts a darkness spell on the pirate, making him completely blind and struggling to see what's happening. Once he finishes, Tuka leaves them to die and paralyzes them again to make sure they can't escape. Suddenly, he realizes that everyone is dead, but Civet is somehow still surviving, which genuinely shocks him. Tuka approaches Civet as he takes his final breath and collapses on the ground, finally dead. Afterward, Tuka and Mist head into the forest, knowing that at least no one will be following them. However, Mist mentions that there might still be the Black Dragon Rider known as the Hero Killer who could be after her. Tuka suddenly remembers that he killed someone like that, which surprises Mist, who wonders how strong this man is. She pledges her loyalty to him and promises to stay by his side through any trouble, while he promises to repay her in kind. They begin their journey together through the forest, unaware of the adventures awaiting them. And that's it for today's anime recap. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss out on our next recaps and anime breakdowns. Speaking of the next video, it's already in the works, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.